So uh, this is the webinar to introduce you to the uh, MSc in Development Studies. Uh, we are looking forward to uh, seeing you uh, in September. We hope that by that time the current world situation becomes much better. Let me also say hello to Alice here. Um, first of all, uh, you are all people who have uh, got offers for the MSc Development Studies or are looking for offers in MSc Development Studies at SOAS. So let me just quickly take you through what you are. Yes, hello Ibukun, we have just started. So we are uh, just going to go through, if you can't hear me, okay, then please just adjust your microphone because some of you can hear me, yes? Krishna, you can hear me. Yes. Okay. So whoever cannot hear me, please adjust the volume. Okay. So, um, you know, as you can see, uh, we would like to welcome you here in SOAS in September 2020. Uh, we are quite uh, sure that by that time the situation will improve and that we will be able to meet in person. Uh, we, we are looking forward to uh, seeing you in September. So when you come to SOAS, what you are going to find is that we are among the world's most diverse uh, institutions and that we will basically be uh, in a campus where you will be with students from many, many different countries and that we will have one year of highly intensive uh, teaching uh, as well as you are going to be able to have uh, interactions with staff and students from a variety of different countries. Uh, you are obviously aware that uh, our SOAS campus is among the world's most diverse campuses uh, in the world and among our teaching staff as well you will find that we have people from many different countries uh, among the lecturers and among the teaching fellows. So what we are hoping to do is via our one year master's degree, uh, you will make it will make a major difference to the way in which you view the world and especially the way in which you view uh, the problems facing developing countries and we will help you think about how to have solutions to these problems. Okay, can I just ask you whether you heard everything that I said and it came to you clearly? Yes. Clearly. yes. Okay, hello. All right, that is great. Uh, do stop me if you have a question, okay? But what I'd like to do is to first run you through the program structure uh, and then I will take questions from you. Uh, but if there is anything that you would like to uh, have me answer while I'm speaking, then of course please go ahead and you do that, okay? All right, so the structure of the course and the teaching format is the following. Uh, for everyone who's coming for the Masters in Development Studies, the MSc Development Studies, you have two so-called core courses that is required for you to take. And these two courses are taught over two terms. Uh, one of these courses is called the Theory, Policy and Practice of Development. Uh, this basically is a course that has uh, borrowed from different social sciences, anthropology, geography, some history, uh, political science, sociology. And the second one is a course which is called the Political Economy of Development. And this is a course which is basically a an economics course for non-economics people, people who have not had any economics background before, uh, can easily take this course and they will be uh, able to understand basic economics as it relates to developing countries. Uh, we are aware that many of you people do not have an economics background. So this is a course which is not a quantitative economics course. What it will help you do is to be able to understand the way in which um, different data is used in international development. And we have a course that will help you uh, understand economics 
which is called an economics for beginners course and that is not a course on which we take any exams for you that is just to, for you to help understand uh, the course on political economy of development the for, the format for our teaching in SOAS is a one hour lecture per week and also a one hour tutorial per week in the lecture we normally have a large gathering of people so for example this year the core courses will have something like 150 students in a large lecture theater format and then you break into tutorial groups one of them per course per week that is basically a one hour session and there you are in groups of around 10 to 12 people there are four optional courses that you will be required to take these are courses which are run over one semester not over two terms but over one term and likewise these are courses that require you to have two hours of teaching time per week either an hour of lecture and an hour of tutorial or a two hour seminar depending upon the course in addition you will write one dissertation for your masters and this is something that we expect you to do primarily from the third term into the end of the summer uh, the assessment for the courses uh, vary but by and large what we have introduced now is for you to write book reviews for you to write reviews of articles for you to write essays and in some cases also to write presentations or blog pieces there are a few courses that ask you to write examples for each of this we will be giving you a lot of guidance so that you are able to do these assessments as best as you can uh, Dana, you have a question regarding uh, whether or not you can only take the ha uh, half unit courses, the 15 credit ones, or whether you can take full 30 credit courses also as options. Yes, you can take the full unit courses across two terms in consultation with whoever the course advisor is, for example, myself, as well as your degree convener. OK, so that is possible for you to do that. Uh, but we will be in consultation in order to help you choose the best uh, courses for what you want to do. Any other questions on that? On the selection of courses? Okay. No, not uh, at all. So, okay. Hello there. How are you? Fine. Hi. So, uh, yes. So, we basically will help you uh, with the course selection. But, yes, technically speaking, you can substitute one full unit course for two half unit courses. Okay. Uh, there are a lot of uh, consultations that are available for you when you are get, getting ready to write your assignments, including with the course tutor and with the uh, teach with the uh, tutors for the lecturers for that course. Uh, there is also resources available for you in terms of what is a good essay, how to write a good essay. And we also help you read academic material via that kind of uh, assistance that we will give you. We also give you considerable feedback on your assessments. Who teaches the courses? Uh, all the courses are taught by a single lecturer or a team of lecturers. Most of these are permanent members of staff. Your tutorials will be held depending on the courses that you take by either the lecturer or by our teaching fellows who are all already holders of PhD degrees or are about to become holders of PhD degrees. Then you have some courses which are seminars or so-called interactive lecture and these will be also available to you to take. Okay, so uh, any questions on courses and things like that? Just ask me uh, if you like or you can ask me later. Hello, Afis. Please mute your mic. Uh, is it possible to... Yes, Ibnu, it is possible to uh, view essays written uh, by students of a previous year. In fact, for each of these courses on the course website, we put a model essay from a previous year and we tell you how many marks that's, that person got. Okay. 
and that basically will help you figure out what we are looking for for an essay. So when you go to the course website, you will find that there is already, uh, you know, that kind of a model essay for you to consult so that you can plan your writing well in advance. OK. All right. What are the courses like? How much reading per week? Uh, as I said to you earlier, most courses are multidisciplinary and they basically most of them will have some degree of social sciences as well as some degree of history. We don't expect that you will have degrees in these subjects in. Uh, yes, that is correct. You cannot, uh, uh, Ibnu, you cannot look at those essays at the moment because you can't sign on to uh, the websites. Those uh, websites require you to have a SOAS uh, email ID in order for you to be able to enter those websites. OK. So, uh, no, at the moment we don't have a provision to show you an, an excellent essay, but once you have a SOAS email ID, then we will be able to show you what an essay, what a very good essay looks like. Uh, Ibu Kun asks, hello, Subir, are there options? Can you just retype your question? Your question has disappeared from my screen. Hello, Ibnu, can you hear me? Uh, are there uh, for, like, more courses than required? Uh, you can audit those courses. You can't take those courses for credit. If you wanted to take more uh, courses than the ones you're required, then there is a provision called auditing a course. When you audit a course, you can sit through the lectures, but you're not required to do the assignments. And also you are not required to, in fact, you cannot sit in the tutorials for those courses. But you can, and in fact, many students do, audit a range of courses within and outside the department. OK, that is very useful because as uh, from your question, I can gather that uh, you are interested in courses which are more than the number of courses that you're looking to take. So yes, that is a provision that is available for you to audit these courses. We would like you to not audit too many courses, obviously because that will take time away from the courses that you're required to take. But we expect that you're all coming in as mature adults and that you will be able to make that kind of a decision. OK. How many pages of readings do you have to do per course per week? Well, these days we don't require you to take more than two or three readings per week. Uh, in each week, you will find that within your course website, there is a list of required courses and then there's a list of recommended, uh, sorry, required readings and a list of recommended readings. So for the required uh, readings for the course, that's the material on which your assessments will be based. The recommended readings are there if you wanted to pursue a topic further, if you wanted to use those readings for writing your dissertation or if you wanted to bring them into your essay writing assignments for any particular course. But you will not be examined on readings which are recommended. You will only be examined on the readings which are required. OK. So uh, there are many newspaper articles, blogs, videos, uh, that kind of material that lecturers will routinely circulate uh, as and when uh, you know, these things become relevant for that particular uh, course. For example, you know, if I was teaching a course right now and we did not uh, anticipate the coronavirus, but somehow it is relevant to the topic, then we will send you links to articles that we think might be useful for you to understand the world as it is changing during the academic year. Okay. Um, a common question that is asked by people is, um, should you do some background reading before you come to SOAS? And of course, my first answer to that question is that we will take care of your learning for your degree when you come to SOAS. However, if you check our website over the summer, 
that is when we put a list of recommended readings as background readings for students who like to come a little bit prepared. And also we will send out a list of keywords or names of people that we would like to have you look at on the internet or in, in an encyclopedia so that uh, you know you can do you can basically uh, come prepared. Uh, Ibnu has a very good question which is that under auditing we say that you need to take the permission uh, of uh, you know the convener of that course outside the department. Yes that is for two reasons. One is that in some courses, they might require some kind of technical equipment. So, for example, if you're looking to audit a language course, then obviously that would be a problem because they have only X number of, uh, you know, learning stations for that particular language. Sometimes if the rooms are, if there's, uh, uh, if the rooms are already full of the students who are required to take a particular course, then conveners may not allow you to audit. But by and large, auditing a course is not a problem. Uh, students from other departments audit our courses and therefore students from our department are also expected to be able to uh, audit courses in other departments. So I hope that answers your question there, Ibnu. OK. So um, how is our SOAS degree different from other development studies degrees? Uh, quite likely, you already have applied to SOAS as well as to some other departments uh, across the UK or across the world. And uh, obviously, uh, you know, I would like very much for you to join SOAS rather than some other place. Uh, so I think uh, I think it's important for me to tell you why the SOAS degree is a, a good degree for you to choose. Uh, one is that you must have checked that we are among the world's top development studies department. Uh, this year we have ranked at number six in the world. Uh, last year we were ranked at number eight in the world. Uh, some years ago we were ranked at number four in the world. So these rankings keep on changing. But I'm happy to say that we have consistently been among the top uh, 10 departments in the world. And our department is the highest rated department of any department within SOAS. Uh, our main difference from most other development studies departments is that we have a highly critical approach to the study of international development. And by critical, what I mean is that we show you what is the mainstream agenda of development currently in the world. We show you how this agenda has been created, what works, what does not work, and the emphasis in our degree and all the other degrees in uh, our department has to do with the study of power. How does power at different levels affect the formation of development programs, but also how it affects how development outcomes are achieved or not achieved sufficiently, uh, etc. We also uh, put a bit of emphasis, in fact, our main focus is an equal emphasis on the theory side of things, but also on the evidence side of things. OK, uh, something new that we have introduced this year, and I think we are unique in doing that, is what we call blended learning. Uh, so for example, we have a number of distance learning modules because we have just started a distance learning master's degree, uh, which will be uh, available from the next uh, OK, Christina, do you rather focus on qualitative and quantitative? Uh, and uh, Ibnu, your question is, uh, again, that has disappeared from the screen. Uh, so we do, uh, you know, depending upon the course, we have a lot of quantitative. Uh, we don't have any, any course which is primarily a quantitative course, though the political economy of development course and some of the optional courses, uh, depending on your choice, uh, you know, uh, will will basically you know go one way or another. We primarily rely on on qualitative data and qualitative studies for most of the readings that we consider. Uh, the course on political economy of development has uh, more emphasis on quantitative uh, in on some topics. Uh, our teaching staff does have a number of economists within them, and some of the some of them are experts in quantitative approaches to. 
uh, international development. Uh, in terms of when would you like to, as Ibnu has asked, when would you like to, uh, when is a good time to contact course conveners? Uh, I take it that you, you are talking about um, auditing a course, and that is basically during the registration period in September. You can write to a course convener in advance, saying to them that you are an incoming student of uh, Masters in Development Studies, and that uh, you would basically like to have um, you know, uh, some uh, experience of auditing that course. So that you can do, but actually auditing requires you to fill out a form that will require you to my signature as the convener of the degree, as well as the signature of the person who is teaching that course. So that you can't at the moment do remotely, that you can only do in uh, September. Uh, there was a question there very uh, briefly, which I saw, which was about distance learning modules as part of their, um, you know, as part of their blended learning. So right now we have uh, on offer six different, um, okay, here is Christina, is it more practical or is it more um, uh, theoretical? I'll just come to that in one minute, Christina. Let me answer the question about uh, distance learning modules. So from this year, we have we are basically putting together six different distance learning modules. Uh, these are critical insights in forced migration, human and critical security studies, partnership beyond borders, which is I'm responsible for that one, which is on NGOs, social movements and civil society. Uh, then there's a course on the politics of gender and feminism. And then there is understanding violence, conflict and development. So these are all courses, uh, courses and modules which are delivered online. They can be accessed remotely at any time. So in other words, if, you, if uh, there is a course that uh, you want to take, uh, but there is some timing clash with another course that you're required to take, you can do the distance learning version of that particular course. So there are different web pages for each of these courses. And if you write to us, we can send you the names of these courses and the links to the web page. Uh, but what we are asking, what we are letting you know is that at the moment, uh, in addition to the courses which are taught via lectures and face to face interaction, there are six courses that we are offering which can be done remotely via which are delivered online and you are more than welcome to take these courses. To go to Christina's uh, question earlier on about the emphasis, is it more on theory versus is it more on uh, practice? Both of them are part and parcel of our teaching. There are some courses which are more hands-on and more practical, and there are other courses which are uh, more oriented in theory. But there is no course which is entirely theory and there is no course which is entirely practice based. In each course, you will find a different combination of, uh, you know, both of these two dimensions. One question that had popped up was if someone has come from an NGO background, uh, how is this course looking for them? Uh, and let me tell you that a large number of incoming students every year are coming in from NGO backgrounds. Some of them are also coming in from uh, public service or having been a bureaucrat in the country from which they are coming, just as about close to half of the students are coming straight from their BA or a previous degree. So your class will have a very nice mix of people who are coming from all of these different backgrounds. One of our best students from this past year um, who got a dissertation, who got a distinction and was the highest marks on, had the highest marks on graduation, uh, came from uh, an NGO and organizing background. He was involved in the organization of small scale fishing populations in Africa and in Asia. And uh, he was also the best student of last year. So coming from an NGO background, we see that as a very good thing. And we see that as uh, you know, preparing you very well. And in fact, many of you will have been admitted to our degree partly on the basis of having come from an NGO background, even though your uh, academic background may not have been in the social sciences, 
Does that answer your question there? Uh, okay, now which, uh, Ibnu, which courses uh, are you looking for in terms of, um, uh, you know, um, uh, auditing within economics or do you want to take them for, for, for credit? Uh, so it depends. Uh, there are courses that our students take regularly from that. Courses in econometrics sometimes tend to be difficult for uh, people to audit uh, because they require a continuous amount of assessment. Uh, so if you want to take that for credit, then you let us know and we will put you in touch with the course convener in the economics department, uh, you know, who will be able to uh, help you with that. Uh, another question which had quickly popped up was, on uh, what kind of opportunities are there for you to exercise leadership or to build up strategic alliances? And that's a very good question. Uh, there is a continuous set of uh, weekly sessions in which leaders from the development sector, sometimes our own ex-students uh, who are now in leadership position within development uh, organizations, will come and they will basically uh, do presentations for our current students, for example, for you people for next year. So there is that issue where it, you can actually interact directly with people who are in leadership positions within uh, the development sector. Uh, in terms of strategic partnerships, uh, there are two or three different ways in which we do that. Uh, one is that uh, there will be, again, workshops on building strategic partnerships in which we bring alumni or senior figures within the development sector. Second, there is a very active SOAS Development Studies Facebook page, in which is called SOAS Old and New. And within that, what you will find is that there are, um, okay, I see your question on advanced uh, microeconomics, Ibnu, and I'll come back to that in just a second. Uh, so basically what we're looking for, uh, you know, in, in these, uh, you know, through the SOAS Old and New website is that we connect our alumni who are now already in positions of middle or senior management in international development with incoming students or people who have just passed on. So there's a fair bit of interaction and support. If you were to go to that web page, uh, you uh, on off on that Facebook page, what you can see is that there are postings for jobs, uh, which are first announced uh, to the students of SOAS by our alumni, and there are also interactions that take place there. Uh, also, your as I said, your classroom and your incoming year will be about 150 uh, odd students, so a lot of partnerships are fostered and made during the course of your master's itself. So Ibnu, if you want to take a course in advanced microeconomics, uh, please get in touch with me and I shall put you in touch with the uh, convener for that course or the office will put you in. Uh, yes, we do have SOAS uh, Commonwealth Shared Scholarship Candidates, uh, Iwukun. In fact, we have just looked at the applications first round uh, of that. And we are in the process of looking at applications for other uh, you know, uh, awards which are administered via the British Academy. So yes, there are those kinds of scholarship uh, opportunities available. Okay, so does that answer the question on leadership and strategic partnerships? Uh, no, uh, Ibukun, uh, these are uh, the Commonwealth ones. Uh, yes, some of them have been, uh, uh, if you applied, where are you from Ibukun, can I ask you? because uh, in, in uh, Nigeria and uh, have you already, was there a form that was available for you to uh, specify? Okay, so you have not heard back. You will uh, probably hear back Ibukun in the uh, next few days because uh, our university was closed as a result of a strike. So uh, you should be able to hear that information in this week, whether or not you have been nominated for that prize, okay? Uh, as far as I'm aware, uh, you know, uh, the uh, internal assessment of Commonwealth ap uh, Award applicants from Nigeria and Ghana has already happened and uh, you will soon hear from the scholarships. Yep, uh, Afis as well, you will hear about uh, this from the scholarships office. We have given them our uh, assessment, those applications. So, uh, you know, because we are slightly delayed due to strikes, as was the entire British higher education system, uh, you should be in a position to hear about that in the next few days. And if not, 
then please get in touch with me and uh, you know I'll, I'll see what kind of information I can pass on to you. Uh, yes, Afis, can you just remind me of your previous question because there are several of them passing, uh, you know, popping up at the same time. Uh, do we have courses that touch upon international education? Uh, there are courses that have components of in, on international uh, education. Uh, as of now, there isn't a full module on international education. So there are courses on that. And then, of course, next door to us is the Institute, for Edu uh, Institute of Education, uh, which is a part of the University of uh, London and, uh, you know, which is a part of University College London. Uh, let me out for you what the current status is of our students being allowed to take courses within the Institute of Education. So uh, I would request you to, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, send me an email uh, so that I can forward you uh, more up to date information. So, you know, something that people like to ask is how much emphasis does it have on research and teaching? Uh, and again, your question has come by and it has disappeared again. So uh, if you could just, uh, okay, uh, on research and teaching and learning about, yes, uh, we have uh, two courses on research methodologies. There is in fact a master's, there's something called the battlefield of methods, and that is an optional uh, where research methodology for development professionals is taught. Uh, in many courses, there is a small number of sessions which are devoted to research methodology. But if someone was not taking the me research methods course, uh, when you start working on your dissertation, uh, that has a very rigorous component of research methodology that is uh, decided between you and your dissertation supervisor, because obviously there is no general research methodology. Uh, we will basically tailor a research methodology reading list for the kind of dissertation that you want to write. So I hope that uh, addresses your question. OK, um, uh, people ask, I mean, you know, how do you deal with uh, issues that come up, which become suddenly very important in international development, but were not so important when students uh, began that particular course? And of course, you know, a very good example of something like this is the current coronavirus pandemic. And I can, yes, uh, guest number two, uh, we have a lot of focus on sub-Saharan Africa in our MSc development studies. And in fact, I can say that something like one third of our teaching staff are active researchers in sub-Saharan Africa. And in fact, many of them do a fair bit of consulting with your national governments or with NGOs which are active in sub-Saharan Africa. So uh, just hold on uh, regarding Corona. Yes. Well, you know, Ibnu, we don't know whether this Corona situation will affect. We are hoping that, uh, you know, because no one can give us a time frame. So there are things which are being planned. Uh, if this uh, current round of the epidemic uh, dies out by the end of the summer or sometime in the middle of the summer, some people expect, I hope that it'll get over in the next uh, two months, then things will happen as normal. If it turns out that this lasts for much longer, then the university and all universities in the UK are currently, as we speak, sitting and planning about what to do. For example, uh, delay the time of intake. Um, Christina, can you imagine to have the uh, totally online uh, session? We are in the process of, the, of uh, putting together a complete uh, master's, which will be an online master's. Uh, and if it is if it is the course that COVID-19, uh, you know, continues, then that is a very much an option on the table. Uh, Steve, Stephanie, uh, if you're asking for a recording, then you will basically have to contact uh, yes, there is an, an entirely 100% international uh, MSc available, and that is not the masters about which I'm talking. Uh, okay, so I mean, you know, for 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 the entirely 100% masters, obviously not all the courses that we have at SOAS at the moment are online. So the range of options that you have for the entirely 100% masters uh, online masters is is not the same as uh, an on-campus masters which is why we have the blended learning option for you. 
in in the sense that at that point you will at this point you will be able to take some of those courses but that's a different masters and that is not the masters about which i'm talking today okay uh, so for example something like the corona thing we already have incorporated that in our teaching uh, in my lecture online lecture for this week uh, we approached it in two different ways. Uh, we looked at the interconnections between international food production, uh, the kind of states and governments that different countries have, and the global economy of travel to try to figure out both the spread of this uh, pandemic, as well as we looked at the uh, strategies undertaken by different kinds of government, for example, authoritarian government, populist governments, uh, liberal democracy, social democracy, etc., to look at how each one of them has uh, been able, how each one of them has approached the problem and the uh, degrees of success they have had so far in terms of being able to control its spread or, uh, or not. So to the extent possible, we try to incorporate uh, events such as that into our teaching. Okay, any questions on that? Okay, so for example, you know, we are, we are looking right now at, uh, you know, different kinds of governments and, uh, uh, for example, in the case of China, we are looking at uh, the extent to which a very strong state in China, uh, which initially, uh, you know, was uh, looking to suppress information about that, was then able to uh, put pressure on its population, particularly with its social isolation policies. Uh, we look at South Korea, for example, where compulsory military service, we speculated, had some impact on uh, the high degrees of rule observ uh, of observing rules, such that uh, you know Korea has been able to have some amount of uh, control over the spread of the uh, disease within their country. Uh, we also briefly looked at USA, Brazil, and India, uh, in which we argued that uh, in both, in all of these countries, uh, you have uh, a kind of very strong populist leader, and the degree of trust that people have had in the leader has been a substitute for civ civic participation, uh, as well as the transparency of information in these countries. So because this is all very new, uh, and the situation is uh, unfolding, we basically only uh, pose these as questions. We also looked at social democratic countries like Denmark, where, for example, government and industry and unions have worked together to provide wage compensation to workers to prevent massive layoffs, uh, as well as to, uh, you know, kind of give people reassurance that their basic necessities will be taken care of by the government. Yes, that is true. That is my uh, Ibukun, Afis, etc. Uh, that is my email address, ss61 at soas.ac.uk. And yes, you can obviously send me follow-up questions uh, that relate to the degree or anything I might have said. Job prospects. Now, you know, uh, the global job market is 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 what it is. Uh, what we can tell you is that most of our students uh, are able to uh, well, they basically move on to SOAS and they go get jobs within prominent NGOs and think tanks. Uh, they work with national governments or regional and international agencies. Uh, many of them go to journalism and media careers. And then quite a number of them get further degrees like a PhD. So that's the kind of overall profile of our student. And it again depends on country. So for example, annually we'll get a lot of Pakistani bureaucrats who will then go back to work as bureaucrats in Pakistan. Uh, that will also be the case with a number of uh, you know, African students. From Ghana at, and from uh, Nigeria, many students who come uh, they write about their career plans because you have to write about uh, in your scholarship applications if you're applying for a scholarship about your service to your nation on your return. So then they go back to their countries and they uh, try to uh, contribute within development in those countries. 
Okay. Uh, what else can I tell you? Uh, what is the best way to get the most out of your degree? Uh, obviously, uh, we have a, an attendance policy within, uh, you know, lectures, but especially within tutorials. We require you to attend tutorials uh, in order for you to be able to pass a particular course. Low attendance in tutorials is not good for your academic performance. Uh, we require you to be able to uh, do your readings every week because you don't want to be left behind. If there is a doubt that you have regarding any reading, yes, then uh, you know what we would like you to do is to come and see us in our office hours, the lecturers or the tutors. Uh, SOAS has many seminars on a weekly basis, sometimes far, far too many seminars from five o'clock onwards on many different issues where we bring scholars from around the world or specialists and experts from around the world. Do attend as many of those as you can. Uh, interact with the speakers. Uh, that is another good way for uh, networking. Uh, of course, London is a great city for international students. It has a lot for you to a uh, lot to offer. And we have the LC close by the University College London close by. Uh, their students come regularly to our seminars and we also uh, encourage our students to go to their seminars. Uh, does SOAS have any options to learn about social entrepreneurship and uh, to set up NGOs on their own? So we have a, an optional course which is called development practice and associated with development practice is a year long seminar series which is called professional practice. So these are the two platforms in which development entrepreneurship, how NGOs work, the practicalities of doing development, those things are basically you know, covered within those two courses or the course and the seminar series really. So uh, uh, then we'll have workshops, but otherwise is if, if you're asking me if there is an optional module beyond development and beyond professional practice, then we do not have one that will allow you to learn how to uh, set up uh, a social enterprise in its own right. OK, OK, now uh, uh, I'm open to questions now, so uh, do ask me questions that you, you, you would like to, because uh, I, I've basically uh, done. I'm done with whatever I needed to uh, cover in my presentation for you. And now we have a 15 minutes uh, remaining for any questions that you might have for me. No, you're not too late, Genial, for asking uh, for applying to uh, the uh, SOAS Masters in Development Studies. Your question has uh, again disappeared. So if you could just put, put that back up there, I can uh, look at the second part of your question. Relationship between schools, okay, and the second one. Um, well, you know, the, the you know the, these were. See, I mean, some until about ten years ago, there was one composite University of London, and the, within the composite University of London, you had different units. Some of them were called college, like King's College, University College, etc. Some of them were called institutes, like the Institute for Commonwealth Studies, the Institute for Education. And some of them are school, the London School of Economics, School of Oriental and African Studies, School of Eastern European and Slavonic Studies. So these were basically names from a previous era. And these are the names by which our institutions became known across the world. So we did not want to change our name from School of Oriental and African Studies. And that is why you have different names across different units of the ex University of London some of which are called college, some of which are called institutes, some of which are called school. I hope that answers that question. Social events. Yes, uh, many, many social events uh, all the time. So, for example, um, OK, let me so as new and old try so as old and new. Uh, you should be able to find it. I've actually only joined it myself uh, in the last few days, so it does exist over there. Uh, 
the social events at SOAS. So there will be, you know, as you come in, there will be several receptions that will happen before classes begin. Uh, then each term, there are social events organized by the department uh, in which uh, students and staff can mingle. So, there, so you know, for each term, there'll be one of uh, those sessions. Uh, then, uh, I mean, what what kind of social event are you looking for? Can you please be a bit more specific? Because a lot of these things will be organized by student societies uh, and by the students' union as well. But the department itself will hold three to four of these social events in which we have informal interactions between students and staff. Level of readiness, Dana. Uh, you know, as, as I said, uh, many of you will be coming straight from the university. Uh, yes, that's the one, young and old. Uh, sorry, not old and new, young and old. You, you're more accurate Ibukin, Ibukin, than me. Um, but basically what we're looking at is that, um, you know, we will have, uh, you know, these different kinds of interactions. Uh, and um, the, the degree of, prepared, uh, of preparedness for someone to come here, because of you will not be coming straight from university, is that you should have a firm grip on international events as they as they relate to the developing world today so you know we would like you to be aware of what is going on in the world we would like you to have some you know high school level knowledge of world history uh so because uh, you know a, a lot of uh yeah okay the questions are coming thick and fast so i'll, I'll, I'll try and see how many of these i can answer so, you know, what we'd like you to do is to have a fair degree of uh, familiarity with, uh, you know, world history. For example, if we said uh, the Spanish colonization of Latin America, you should have some working knowledge of that. Uh, if we talk about the anti-colonial struggles of Asia and Africa in the 1950s and 1960s, then you should be aware that these were countries that went through an anti-colonial struggle. Uh, if we say something along the lines of, uh, you know, the Maoist revolution in China, then you should know that this is, uh, you know, uh, something that happened, uh, which was of uh, tremendous importance and so on. So uh, that is the kind of degree of familiarity that we would uh, like to, uh, you know, uh, expect from you, because then it makes our job of uh, delivering the one hour lecture much easier. One question that just popped up was uh, regarding uh, part time students. Uh, so, you know, the structure of the course, of course, is the same, except that you'll be doing it over two years and not over one year. Uh, so for part time students, uh, it is, you know, the first year is your two core courses and the second year is your four and the dissertation. And uh, within that, what we expect you to do is to be at SOAS for two days of the week at the minimum, okay? So what we will do is to prioritize you in terms of enrolling you in the tutorial groups so that you don't have to come on a third day. You're obviously welcome to come that uh, to come on a third day, but we try to consolidate your uh, required presence on campus to two days of the week. That is our aim. Okay, is there a question I did not answer because so many came? Can you change from full time to part time? Yes, you can. Uh, it is normally, uh, you know, I mean, people who are coming from abroad, you need to take a look at what your visa will allow you to do. But if you are coming in from, uh, you know, home or EU student, uh, then, uh, though, of course, you know, after Brexit, that is a bit of uncertainty. But if you're a student from within Britain, you can come in as a part as a full time student and transition on to a part time. It will require a kind of an application process, but we have not had a problem. Uh, specific skills, understanding fiscal space, advocacy, yes. Uh, yes, I mean, uh, the okay, so your specific skills will be uh, of two different ways. Uh, you know, one can think of that in two different ways. Because we, we will be reading a bunch of government documents and international agency documents uh, in our required readings and recommended readings, Yes, of course, there'll be a deep degree of familiarity that you will uh, develop with the kind of international development lingo, if you want to call it that. 
and that also includes the uh, evol kind of evolving set of um, jargon or development speak uh, that is current within the development sector at that point in time. So yes, uh, you know, you will be able to familiarize yourself and to get on top of that kind of thing. Uh, analytical uh, reasoning will be another skill and the understanding, as you said, of the fiscal landscape. There are particular courses which are on issues of financialization, for example, and that is also, uh, you know, a theme in many different uh, courses that we follow. So uh, if you are looking at aspects of finance as they are uh, connected to contemporary international development, then in many courses that particular aspect will be touched upon and in some courses uh, more in depth than in others. Okay, send me any more questions that you have. Most important of your application, is it your supporting statement? You know, Genyar, yes, it is your supporting statement. Uh, and, you know, if you're getting, uh, please tell your referees to write about your particular strengths. We need, we, re, we rely quite a lot on the reference letters that we get for, uh, you, that support your application. Uh, so, for example, someone might write in your favor, he or she is a very good candidate, uh, and as happens, uh, he, he or she is a very nice person, etc. But if they could just write a few lines, on exactly what makes you a suitable student for an MSc in SOAS, that helps us quite a lot. So, the, you know, uh, apart from your personal statement, we assume that you've seen the entry criteria with respect to marks. We are somewhat flexible with respect to that. If, uh, if your work experience can cover for you not meeting the, you know, require the marks uh, requirement. Um, to view previous students' work, essays, book reviews, yes, uh, there is, as I said at the beginning of the session, uh, for each course, uh, we do have on the course websites uh, model book reviews and essays from a previous year so that you're able to see what kind of written assignments is given high marks. These are not required for you to follow, but these will give you a good idea as to what someone did in a previous year for which they were given a high distinction. Poverty uh, is both an option in its own right, uh, Dana, as, for example, the so-called course on the working poor, but poverty is very much at the center of each and every course within the department that I can think of. Courses on gender will probably also have weeks on poverty. My course on social movements and civil society or is, uh, you know, has several weeks on the politics of poor people, uh, theory, policy, and practice. Your required course has a week on poverty, and poverty is a, poverty alleviation is a theme. Uh, indices of poverty and calculations of poverty is a key element of political economy of development. So yes, poverty is one of the central themes that you can find across uh, the core courses and in many, if not most, of the options. Okay. Statistical software uh, and academic or professional. Uh, no, we don't have any particular preference. Uh, and Genia, just hang on to your question. Uh, no, we don't have any particular preference for uh, the kind of statistical package that you might use. Uh, there might be that you know particular courses you know have their own, but uh, since my own work is not at all statistical, uh, I would not be able to answer your question on that. But you might want to have. Uh, you know, send me that question as 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 a as a, as, a, as an email. Okay, uh, two questions that had just popped up. Can I just have you uh, put them back back up again, please? Uh, referees, the guidance applicants. Yes, that is correct. Um, you can put up to two referees. Some people even put three. But uh, we basically like if if you're out of the university set up for quite a while and therefore it is awkward for you to go back to your old university lecturer or professors to ask them for a letter, then you can obviously go for a professional uh, letter or uh, someone who knows you professionally. Even in that case, what I would like to emphasize is that the person 
should not only write about your professional skills to some extent they should write about your understanding of development issues whether you have uh, you know what kind of analytical mind you have because those are helpful to us uh, in making our decisions to offer you uh, admission if i'm to hand my application in the next two weeks when would i hear i try to because your applications will come to me and i'd like to uh, answer back to the admissions office on the day uh, that i get the applications if sometimes the emails come with eight or ten different applications i might take a few days extra but otherwise we have a very rapid uh, turnaround on applications Uh, Christina, when are the exams uh, held, you say? So at the moment, uh, you know, we, we are basically, uh, you know, many courses will not have an exam. In fact, at the moment, very few courses have an exam. So if you are taking a course which, ha which is over two units, let us say theory, policy and practice of development, the structure right now, which is a required course, the structure right now is that your first assignment is due in week six, uh, in, which is in term one. Uh, your second assignment is due around week number 13, which is in term two. And then you are given uh, take home essay questions for which your answers are due basically around April. This year, everything has been disrupted by the coronavirus, but you will basically not be sitting in an exam hall or taking an exam. Uh, in courses where exams are to be held, those exams are basically held between the end of May and the beginning of June, uh, so and the beginning of July. Uh, so that is your exam period. But as I said, these days there are very, very few courses that still have an exam. Okay, uh, good to talk to all of you and uh, good luck. Uh, yes. Dana, yes, that is correct. You can take a look at previous topics. OK, I look forward to uh, all of you and please do stay safe in this uh, situation of uh, pandemic. Uh, you know, then, uh, we, you know, so that we can all see each other in September. And yes, Ibnu, uh, we will help you with your dissertation topic and your research methodologies, depending upon the topic that you choose. All right. All right. Goodbye. See you later. Bye bye, Office.